Many of you will think of Isaac Newton as the man who revolutionized science in 1687 by quantifying gravitational attraction, thus turning physics once and for all from a speculative armchair pursuit into a discipline of such precision and power that it could send men to the moon and beyond. Or you may have in mind the fiery young Newton who in 1672 took the Royal Society of London by storm when he described his experiments proving that white light is actually a mixture of unaltered spectral colors, thereby overturning 2,000 years of optical doctrine. You may even be thinking of Newton the mathematician who created the calculus in the process dethroning geometry from its hitherto unquestioned position as the queen of the mathematical pursuits. But I doubt that many of you will have a clear picture of Newton as the man who spent more than 30 years sweating in solitude over his alchemical furnaces in the attempt to make such exotic nostrums as the net, the green lion, Mercury's caducean rod, and the scepter of Jove. <laughs> and yet we know it as a historical fact that Newton did precisely that. His servant, Humphrey Newton, who was Newton's laboratory assistant for five years, wrote the following awestruck words in the year of his former master's death. He rarely went to bed until two or three of the clock sometimes not until five or six, lying about four or five hours, especially at spring and fall of the leaf, at which times he used to employ about six weeks in his elaboratory, the fire scarce going out either night or day, he sitting up one night and I the other, till he had finished his chemical experiments, in the performance of which he was the most accurate, strict, exact. What his aim might be, I was not able to penetrate into. But his pains, his diligence at these set times made me think he aimed at something beyond the reach of human art and industry. He would sometimes, though very seldom, look into an old moldy book which lay in his laboratory I think it was entitled Agricola on Metals, the transmuting of metals being his chief design. Here we have the unforgettable picture of a feverish and sleep-deprived Newton refusing to leave his laboratory until daybreak for weeks on end. What was the purpose of his obsessive experimentation? At first, Humphrey is coy, telling us that Newton's goals were inscrutable but that they seem to reach beyond the limits of human art and industry. This is a very broad hint indeed, for in the 17th century, the standard example of an art, or rather technology, that pushed nature to its limits and beyond was alchemy. Ever since the Middle Ages, the transmutation of base metals into precious ones had been the defining issue among scholars and theologians that tested the ultimate power of man radically to alter nature. The only thing that challenged the place of metallic transmutation as a benchmark for human power was the equally hubristic goal of making an artificial human being, or homunculus, another long-standing alchemical desideratum. Uh, this is an image of a uh, 17th century alchemist. It's a uh, Dutch genre painting by a man called David Rickart III. And as you can see, the alchemist is holding a flask in which is a homunculus. And his wife, looking rather distraught, perhaps at the thought of being rendered obsolete, is standing in the background wringing her hands. And in the bottom right, beneath the alchemist, you see a little child holding a bladder, which he's blowing up. That's a typical symbol of folly in this Dutch genre painting. 
In the eyes of many, it was the ability of humans to work such radical changes on nature that distinguished man from God. Knowing the moral failings of humankind, the critics of alchemy maintained God had wisely placed limits on man's power over nature. In this sense, alchemy occupied a position rather like that of bioengineering today, with many of the same ethical and scientific issues focusing ultimately upon mankind playing God. Hence, it comes as no surprise when Humphrey Newton tells us at the end of the quotation that the transmuting of metals was Newton's chief design. Newton was an alchemist, and there can be no doubt of it. But for those who refuse to be convinced by Humphrey Newton's testimony, there still remains the inelectable obstacle provided by the 131 or more surviving manuscripts that Newton devoted to alchemy. Many of these admittedly are mere transcripts made by Newton of his reading, and one does not, of course, have to believe everything that one reads. And yet, among these manuscripts, there are two fully functional laboratory notebooks, well, fully functional up to a point, I should say, <laughs> recording Newton's experimentation from the 1660s up to 1696. The two notebooks, both kept at Cambridge University Library, record Newton's dated alchemical experimentation alongside some of his most famous discoveries, such as the fact that white light is a mixture of distinct spectral colors rather than a homogeneous medium. Um, this is one of the famous images from this notebook, and what that depicts is Newton sticking a bodkin, that's something like a letter opener, um, underneath his eyeball and pressing on the back of his eyeball to produce images like you see in the upper right, those concentric circles called phosphenes, which are, again, produced by pressure on the eyeball. Newton was interested in determining um, the relationship between the speed of putative corpuscles of light hitting the eye and the production of different colors. So that's what he's up to there. And this is uh, the very same notebook where Newton records his experiments in trying to produce things like the hollow oak, the net, and the caduceus of mercury. And this is just a Latin passage um, that is uh, talking about how the salt of uh, sulfur has an affinity with mercury. I mean, excuse me, the salt of Venus, rather. That's a Venus symbol, and that uh, probably represents copper. Um, and then he asks um, whether this salt of Venus is a mediator um, with the uh, caduceus, that is where it says, utrumque ad caduceum comparandum, uh, abbreviated there at the bottom. Uh, again, he's trying to make this uh, nostrum, the caduceus of uh, mercury. So all of these terms, these alchemical terms, are taken from an author who was perhaps Newton's favorite alchemical source, the mysterious early American alchemist George Starkey, who was educated at Harvard College in the 1640s. And this is an image, an idealized image of Starkey from a Dutch edition of one of his works. Um, as you can see, it's a scene of poverty. And uh, underneath in Dutch, um, you have the uh, biblical um, proverb about... Uh, eating your bread in the sweat of your brow. This is supposed to depict Starkey's altruism and how he is making uh, chemical medicines for the benefit of mankind. Well, Starkey also wrote elaborate alchemical treatises in Latin and English under the extravagant nom de guerre of Irenaeus Philolathes, a peaceful lover of truth. Allow me to read a short recipe from Starkey's most famous, famous Philolathan work called The Open Entrance to the Closed Palace of the King um, so that you may get a taste of Newton's um, preferences in alchemical literature. 
Yes. Okay, so this is Starkey in the guise of Philolethes, whom I'm quoting. This chaos is called our arsenic, our air, our luna, our magnes, our calibs, but in diverse respects because our matter undergoes various states before our regal diadem is extracted from the menstrual blood of our whore. <laughs> so learn who the comrades of Cadmus are, and who the serpent who ate them, and what the hollow oak on which Cadmus transfixed the serpent. Learn what the doves of Diana are, which conquer the lion, by beating him, the green lion, I say, which is really the Babylonian dragon, killing all by means of his venom, end of quote. <laughs> Though Starkey was neither entirely peaceful nor excessively amatorious severity, he was one of the most famous alchemical writers of the 17th century. All of Starkey's exotic terms have been decoded in modern times to reveal such minerals and chemicals as antimony, sulfide, iron, mercury, and silver. To make matters short, the passage that I quoted contains an extremely abbreviated and elusive recipe for one of the great secrets of alchemy, the sophic or philosophical mercury. The sophic mercury was a material that was supposed to amalgamate with gold like ordinary mercury, but to penetrate into the pores of the noble metal more deeply than ordinary mercury would, and to break the metal down into its more primitive constituents. When sealed up in a flask and heated, the amalgam would vegetate into the form of a tree that would supposedly lead to the production of the philosopher's stone. And here is an example of Starkey's tree produced in a modern chemical laboratory. The Philosopher's Stone, familiar to Harry Potter fans as the Sorcerer's Stone, was a marvelous agent of transmutation that could supposedly convert a vast quantity of base metal into gold. Clearly then, the Sophic Mercury was a necessity if one wanted to arrive at the Philosopher's Stone. So how did one obtain the Sophic Mercury itself? In the 17th century, crude antimony, antimony sulfide, was widely used to assay precious metals and to purge them of their impurities. So Starkey, Newton's source, decided to use antimony as a means of purging not only gold but quicksilver and purifying it of its dross. In order to carry this purification out, Starkey first extracted metallic antimony from its sulfide ore, stibnite, by heating it with iron. The stibnite is the horror in Starkey's passage since it was thought to be the source, the indiscriminate mother of all the other metals and minerals. The diadem extracted from the horror's blood is the star regulus of antimony, a crystalline version of metallic antimony that forms if the molten metal is left to cool under a thick slag, a modern creation of the uh, star regulus of antimony. The references to the green lion, to the serpent that ate the companions of the Greek hero Cadmus, and to the Babylonian dragon are all allusions to stibnite. The eating of Cadmus' comrades refers to the addition of iron to the antimony, antimony ore that is necessary for its reduction to metallic antimony. Finally, the two doves of Diana refer to two parts of silver that Starkey used in order to facilitate the making of a mercury-antimony amalgam. By repeatedly distilling the mercury from a mixture, of silver and antimony, Starkey arrived at his ultra-pure sophic mercury. The fact that Newton adopted Starkey's terminology and many of his processes in the records of his own private experimentation can only mean that he took the works of Philolethes very seriously indeed. This is uh, the collected works of Starkey under the name of Philolethes, published in Modena, in uh, 1695. Um, as you can see, it's uh, 
got a quite um, figurative uh, title page, and um, that actually is an encoded recipe um, describing exactly the process that I just detailed. The figure of antimony with his arms outstretched standing on the globe forming the Salvator Mundi symbol is a circle surmounted by a cross. And that was the standard symbol for antimony in those days, the circle surmounted by the cross. He is holding two birds, or they're perched at least, at the ends of his fingers, and those are the two parts of refined silver. Um, and he is holding um, two caduceuses, one representing what they call vulgar mercury, that is simply quicksilver, the other representing the sophic mercury. So, in fact, that's an encoded recipe. And this is uh, another work of Philolethes um, called Ripley Revived for the 15th century English alchemy, alchemist George Ripley, whom Starkey commented on. And uh, you can see the entire um, image represents the door, the locked door to the alchemical secret um, surrounded by circles representing different processes required to make the philosopher's stone. Well, now that we've established the fact that Newton was a serious alchemist, we're in a position to ask where he obtained this conviction that the hermetic science held something genuine. People often wonder why scientific figures of the caliber of Robert Boyle, for example, the so-called father of modern chemistry, and above all, Newton, believed in the possibility of transmuting one metal into another. There are two ways to approach this question, one theoretical, the other practical. From the viewpoint of theory, it's enough to say for now that the mechanical philosophy of the 17th century, which postulated a uniform material out of which all things are composed, was quite amenable in principle to the transmutation of many, if not all, things into one another. Newton believed that matter is hierarchical in composition. At the lowest stage of composition, in fact, at the bottom of the picture, there are only unbelievably small, hard particles of solid matter which are endowed with immaterial forces. These particles are all identical with one another, but they combine with one another to make larger, less dense particles, uh, one row up. Um, the particles of the second stage, in turn, combine with still others to make even larger, even more porous particles. Eventually, these molecule-like particles reach the stage at which chemical composition occurs. They are semi-permanent corpuscles that account for chemical difference by mutually coming together and separating, and they account for chemical stability <clears throat> um, by virtue of their semi-permanent character. But what if one could produce a solvent that was sufficiently subtle that it could penetrate between the pores of these large corpuscles and break them down into their more primitive constituents? Would it not be possible then to transmute one metal into another just by building up the particles as one pleased? This root idea was shared both by mechanical philosophers such as Newton and Robert Boyle, but also by numerous alchemists of their time, of whom George Starkey was one of the more prominent. As we've already seen, um, Starkey's sophic mercury was supposed to work by infiltrating the pores of gold and dissolving it into its constituents, an idea that Newton also championed. In fact, the very notion that metals are made up of smaller particles that are themselves more or less permanent is an alchemical idea that had already been championed in the Middle Ages. This hierarchical form of atomism was a widespread tenet of alchemy extending from the 13th century into modern times and an idea that still resonated at the time when John Dalton and his peers invented modern chemical atomism at the beginning of the 19th century. 
But the mere theoretical possibility of one corpuscle turning into another does not alone account for the decades of hard work that Newton, for one, devoted to transmutational alchemy. For he and others like him were the beneficiaries of hard evidence that minerals could grow and vegetate beneath the earth as well as in a flask. Saltpeter, alum, and vitriol, for example, were all known to replenish their supply after having been collected by miners. Saltpeter underwent continual efflorescence out of basements and dry soil in the form of nitre growing on walls and floors. Uh, those of you who've read Edgar Allan Poe's short story, The Cask of Amontillado, will know of this phenomenon. Before walling up the still living Fortunato among the skeletons in a dank catacomb, the murderer Montresor exclaims, the nitre, see, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the walls. As for alum, it too is found to be replenished in nature, thanks to the action of sulfurous flame fumes, rather, in the volcanic areas called sulfataras. Growth and replenishment was also known to occur with vitriols. Iron and copper vitriols, which we nowadays call sulfates, were found adhering to the walls within mines as green and blue crystals that grew and changed with time. In fact, it's not just unrefined minerals, but pure metals themselves that appear to grow or vegetate in nature. Native silver, for example, is often found in the form of twisted stalks and branches beneath the earth. There's one example. Here's another. As you can see, it's intermixed with quartz in that case. And yet another. The black is silver sulfide on the surface. Copper, too, forms branching formations, or can do, in its native state, as you see here. And in another form, in this case, covered with malachite. All of this evidence and more convinced miners and alchemists alike that the earth was filled with life and that mineral veins were the branches of huge subterranean trees. And just as one can pick an apple when it's still green or wait for its sweet red fruit, so it was possible to collect the minerals of base metals such as lead or copper before they had a chance to ripen into mature silver or gold. There was further evidence that such ripening processes really were happening within the earth. The most obvious example occurred in the case of lead and silver. Even today, it's a well-known fact of mineralogy that silver and lead ores are often found together. Argentiferous lead ores, as they're called, can be very rich in silver. A classic case is the mineral galena, or lead sulfite. Sulfide, rather. Um, here is one formation of galena. There's another. And galena is often bound together with argentite or silver sulfide, which looks a lot like galena at any rate. Given the other facts about mineral growth and replenishment that I've adduced so far, it was not unreasonable for miners and alchemists to infer that the lead was slowly ripening into its more mature form, namely silver. But of course, once they're dug up, most minerals seem to be inert and dead. If one could only actuate their hidden life, then he could make them multiply and mature into their noblest forms, the precious metals. This, of course, was the dream of many an alchemist, and Newton himself was clearly not immune to it. Newton, in fact, wrote a famous manuscript on vegetation, which you can now view online on the Chemistry of Isaac Newton website. 
The manuscript called Of Nature's Obvious Laws and Processes in Vegetation begins with the claim that metals can be made to vegetate, that is to grow within a flask. As Newton says, that metals vegetate after the same laws, proved transitorily from the circumstances observed by miners, more fully from the consent of the Sufi, that means wise men, with one another and with nature's process and the strange distractions of all other chemists from both nature and one another, and the corruptibility of all things, a description of their vegetation in the earth, a description of their vegetation in a glass, and that this is as much natural as t'other. He could have in mind any number of processes for making dendrites, but I've chosen two examples that were very well known in the 17th century for today's lecture. The first is the so-called Arbor Dianae, or Tree of Diana. Diana was the traditional goddess of the moon, and the alchemists had associated the moon with silver since late antiquity. Hence, a tree of Diana should be a silver tree, and so, in fact, it is. So, the tree of Diana is composed of silver and mercury made by putting some silver-mercury amalgam in a dilute solution of silver and mercury dissolved in nitric acid. In real time, it takes about an hour to complete its growth, but the present clip prepared at Indiana University uses time-lapse photography. Um, while that is uh, finishing up, I'm going to pass to another example of metallic vegetation known to the 17th century and one that I can produce live for you since it doesn't involve mercury. It takes just a few seconds for it to get going. Well, um, this is what is today known as a silica garden and the uh, metal, that, or metallic salt rather, that seems to be growing is iron in the form of ferric chloride. Uh, in Newton's day, the garden was made by first dissolving iron in what was called spirit of salt, that is what we call today hydrochloric acid, and then boiling the solution to dryness. The reddish sediment is nowadays called ferric chloride. In the meantime, a material known then as oil of sand was made by fusing sand with salt of tartar, which we now call potassium carbonate, at a high temperature. When you do this, a white powder is formed which dissolves into a thick, clear liquid in humid air. This oil of sand is what we nowadays call potassium silicate. It's a close relative of the much more common commercial water glass, also known as sodium silicate. So here's what happens when you put your metal salt into the oil of sand. The salt gradually dissolves in the potassium silicate solution, and the solution is immediately encased in a silicate shell. Osmotic pressure causes the shell to rupture, the salt solution rises, and the process is repeated, forming a sort of tree-like structure. One could, I think you'll agree, easily think that it displays signs of life. To alchemists of the 17th century, dendritic formations, such as the Silica Garden and the Tree of Diana, must have made it seem as if the biblical command to be fruitful and multiply had been realized in the metallic realm. We've seen then that alchemists and miners had good reason to think that metals and minerals grew within the earth. Moreover, they were able to replicate this growth outside of the earth within their laboratory vessels. But there was also another piece of evidence for metallic transmutation that was much more direct than the one supplied by vegetation. For the natural world itself provided plenty of evidence of metallic transmutation to 17th century thinkers. 
The fact is that metals do indeed seem to turn into one another in nature. I refer to the well-known phenomenon of vitriol springs found in mining areas such as Goslar in Germany and Chimnitz in Slovakia. In these and other European mining centers, early modern observers found naturally occurring blue vitriol within the shafts, which formed springs and pools impregnated with the vitriol in a dissolved state. Um, this is an example of a uh, tin mine in Cornwall, the South Crofty Tin Mine, and someone has pointed a flashlight up the shaft there to that patch of blue on the inside of the mine. That is copper vitriol or copper sulfate, blue vitriol. If one took an iron object and placed it in the pool formed by such deposits, or better yet, iron filings, a transmutation into copper quickly occurred. Hence, in a 1669 letter to his friend Francis Aston, who was about to travel to the continent, Newton asked the young voyager to confirm the transmutative power of vitriol springs in Chimnitz. As the editors of Newton's correspondence have determined, Newton's question stemmed from his reading of a very prominent German alchemical writer named Michael Meyer, who'd written on the subject in 1617. The young Newton, who had only immersed himself in alchemy in the mid-1660s, was clearly looking for proof of metallic transmutation. As the 17th century progressed, it came to be common knowledge that the same process could be carried out in the laboratory with vitriol that had been dissolved in water. And we're going to try that now. So what I have here, some of you will recognize as a drywall saw, but that's not what's important. Um, <laughs> it's a steel blade, okay, obviously containing iron. And this is so-called blue vitriol or copper sulfate uh, solution. So what we're going to do is stick the blade in there for a bit and see what happens. Be patient. <laughs> Alchemy requires patience. As you can see, the uh, silica tree is almost, no, it actually has reached the surface. What then happens is the solution spreads across the surface and forms what looks like a canopy, perfectly natural for a tree. Well, let's take it out and see what we've got. Oh, yes, look at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but the iron isn't really being transmuted into copper, as you all know. Rather, it's slowly going into solution while the copper in the vitriol, today known, as I said, as copper sulfate, comes out of solution and replaces it. Ironically, it was an alchemist, of all people, who proved that this was actually a process of plating and dissolution rather than one of actual transmutation. The Belgian alchemical and medical writer, Johann Baptista van Helmont, had already argued the case in a 1624 booklet on spas. Van Helmont was a chemical atomist, and he was able to demonstrate that the amount of copper in a given vitriol solution was stable. Once an iron artifact had been covered with copper, the solution became depleted, and no more so-called transmutations could occur with it. Van Helmont concluded that for every atom of copper that had passed from the vitriol to the iron object, an atom of iron went into solution. The copper, he said, merely filled the empty pores left by the departing iron atoms. Although Van Helmont's terminology here may sound strikingly modern, he was in fact relying on the alchemical tradition of atomism that extended back to at least the 13th century. Van Helmont's remarkably prescient analysis seems to have been unknown to the young Newton in 1669, however, 
Like many another aspiring alchemist, the youthful Newton looked to copper vitriol as a demonstration of the viability of transmutation. Well, there was yet another type of evidence that alchemists had going for them. Early modern scientific figures, particularly Newton's older contemporary and correspondent, Robert Boyle, were keenly interested in public transmutations performed by self-styled wandering adepts. These figures were legion in the 17th century, so common that they spawned a genre of literature that a number of years ago I dubbed the transmutation history. Books or tracts filled with eyewitness accounts of transmutations. Stuffed with verifiable dates, locations, and other circumstantial evidence, these documents served as witnesses of the elusive figures who were supposedly countering the doubt of their adversaries with genuine demonstrations of the philosopher's stone. One of the most famous of these transmutation histories was recounted in a work called The Golden Calf, published in 1667 by Johann Helvetius, physician to the Prince of Orange in the Netherlands. Although Helvetius had been a skeptic about alchemy, a visit from a mysterious stranger in 1666 changed his opinion, his opinion utterly. Helvetius refers to his guest as Elias Artista, Elias the artist, summoning up the pedigree of the prophet Elijah, whose second coming had already been predicted by the Bible. Despite his exalted lineage, Elias was a cheaply dressed man from northern Holland with a common pockmarked face and straight black hair. This alias gave Helvetius a tiny morsel of the philosopher's stone, smaller than a rapeseed, and promised to return on the following day. By the next afternoon, however, alias did not return, and in fact, he was never again seen by Helvetius. So Helvetius tested the fragment of the philosopher's stone by himself on six drams of lead. Melting the lead, he threw in the tiny crumb. Upon cooling it, Helvetius found that it had, in fact, turned the lead to gold. In the company of the local mint master, Helvetius then took the newly manufactured gold to the house of a silversmith named Brechtelius so that it could be assayed for purity. The usual test in those days, called quartation, worked by fusing three parts of silver with one part of gold and then dissolving the alloy in nitric acid. The silver dissolves in the acid along with other impurities, but the gold remains at the bottom of one's vessel as a black insoluble powder. After washing and filtering the gold, one can normally fuse it to regain the quantity that one started with. But in the case of Helvetius's gold, the test did not work. Well, you're probably thinking, aha, of course it failed. After all, the alchemical gold must have been fake. But in fact, that is not what Helvetius tells us. In the presence of the silversmith, he found that the assaying test actually led to a net increase in the weight of the gold employed. In other words, the vanishingly small fragment that Alias had supplied of the philosopher's stone had not exhausted its power on the six drams of lead. Hence, when the transmuted gold was added to the silver for the sake of carrying out the quotation test, the gold, still containing a portion of the philosopher's stone, actually transmuted some of the silver into yet more gold. Well, we can make what we like of Helvetius's transmutation history. Clearly, there must have been fraud involved at some level, since the genuine transmutation of metals, I need hardly say in this company, requires tremendous amounts of energy, such as one employs in the particle accelerator. But what is important is the seeming, the apparent veracity of the story, which involved the local mint master, and the silversmith, Brechtelius. Helvetius' story was so convincing, in fact, that the philosopher Benedict Spinoza paid a visit 
to Bractelius upon hearing about the golden calf. In a letter to his friend Yorig Yellus, Spinoza reports that Bractelius confirmed the story and that Helvetius was still able to display the gold-encrusted crucible in which the transmutation had occurred. Surely this was exactly the sort of story to inspire the learned to a belief in alchemy. But there were other demonstrations of transmutation that were even more public than the one described by Helvetius. The court of the Holy Roman Emperor in Vienna was particularly well known for public transmutations. One of these was performed by Emperor Leopold's trusted economic advisor, Johann Joachim Becker, who had a medallion coined to commemorate his transmutation of lead into silver. Uh, Becker's coin has survived in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. And there's the uh, obverse of it. Uh, in the year 1675, in the month of July, I, J.J. Becker, doctor, uh, this ounce of very pure silver from lead by alchemical art transmuted. So that's the very silver that he transmuted, made into a coin. But Becker's transmutation was not of the most spectacular type since it did not involve gold, after all. And yet such transmutations into gold were publicly produced. Often they involved a silver object like this one, if you can uh, show it. Yes. This is a medallion that I, in good alchemical fashion, coined myself, <laughs> which accounts for the fact that <laughs> it doesn't look very good. Well, all right, but it's silver, all right? That's what counts. Um, so one of the most famous of these public transmutations was the one performed by Wenzel Zeiler, an Augustinian monk at the court of Leopold I in Vienna. Newton's compatriot and friend Robert Boyle was deeply interested in Zeiler's story and went so far as to interview members of the Viennese court in order to determine its veracity. Boyle's notes form part of an eventual dialogue on transmutation that he wrote but never published. Among Zeiler's various feats of transmutation, one in particular stands out. In 1677, Zeiler transmuted a huge medallion weighing seven kilograms and measuring a foot in diameter into gold. The medallion, which survives in the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, is an ornate objet d'art with an obsequious dedication to Leopold on one side and reliefs of the 42 Holy Roman Emperors with Leopold in the center on the other. And that's what you have here. The transmutation which occurred on St. Leopold's day took place when Zeiler had the medallion dipped into a mysterious solution. As a result, only the lower portion of the medallion, as you can see, the part immersed in the solution was transmuted into gold. You can see there is a silver part still at the top. Well, today I'm going to try to do what Zeiler did over 300 years ago. I haven't tried this many times in public, so I hope it works. If it doesn't work, I hope you won't subject me to the punishment meted out to one failed alchemist who was forced to sit in a red-hot iron chair. <laughs> or, worse yet, the standard punishment for unsuccessful alchemical charlatans in the early modern period to be hanged from golden gallows and left to rot upon the gibbet in a golden taffeta suit. Well, let's see if it worked. Yeah, 
Yes, I believe it did, or at least it started to work. Uh, can everyone see? Is that, uh, does that look like gold in the part that was immersed? How did I do that? <laughs> you may wonder. I think I see some of you shifting eagerly in your seats. Maybe you're trying to extract your wallets in the hope of investing in my process. I don't suggest it. As it turns out, the medallion Zeilers, not mine, was subjected to chemical analysis in the 1930s and discovered to be an alloy of silver and gold. Moreover, I do not advise you to attempt to reverse the famous process of Midas by inserting your finger in the solution and waiting for a conversion into gold. The mysterious solution that seems to be turning one metal into another is actually concentrated nitric acid. <laughs> in fact, what happened in the case of the medallion is what modern technicians refer to as depletion gilding or surface enrichment. Since nitric acid will corrode silver but not gold, it eats away the silver from the surface of the medallion and leaves the gold behind. Hence, we have an ersatz transmutation. Although you might have expected that this fraud would have been detected, in Zeiler's case, it was not, nor in the case of many other public transmutations. As a result, Boyle, Newton, and others were the heirs of a large and well-established literature informing them that the artificial transmutation of base metals into gold had been witnessed by the most powerful princes and their ministers throughout 17th century Europe and verified thereby. This coupled with their own observations of vegetation and transmutation of lesser metals like copper and iron was enough to give them a lifetime of encouragement. Not that Boyle or Newton needed much further encouragement. We know from John Conduit, the man who married Newton's niece, that in his final years, long after Newton had become master and warden of the mint, thereby assuming official responsibility for maintaining the gold standard in England, he was still interested in alchemy. In his draft memoirs of Newton's life, Conduit reports a conversation in which the aged scientist reminisced about his earlier years, saying that, quote, if he was younger, he would have another touch at metals, end quote. It seems that Newton never utterly gave up his dream of metallic transmutation, even though he was no longer spending sleepless nights straining at something beyond the reach of human art and industry. I hope you are now in a better position to understand the reasons behind Newton's alchemical passion and to see that his dream, far from being the isolated madness of a genius, was actually the e-day fix of the age of gold. Thank you. <laughs>